Welcome back. Some call me soulless, a ginger who lists the sun and religious authoritarianism as enemies. DJ Meow Mix! Thanks for coming back into the studio to record our bonus episode this week, the second part of our expose of the North Hudson Park encounter. Dunks, keep giving those birds outside the ocular pat down. Appreciate you. We've returned for part two, where I'll primarily be reading from the report by Ted Blosher, The Stonehenge Incidents. On January 18th, while we were videotaping on-site statements by George Obarski and Bill Palowski, we were astounded to learn that a second Stonehenge doorman, Bill Daliz, had seen a landed object in the field opposite the apartment house just three days earlier. At the same hour as the earlier events and in precisely the same location. He told us that he had seen two oval forms slightly overlapping each other, one red and the other orange, just beyond the crest of the hill. Upon going outside to observe them more closely, they had ascended rapidly in the sky as a single unit, their colors darkening as they went up. He told us on January 18th that he had known nothing of any other reports. We interviewed him at length on January 25th. Coincidences were abounding. A sighting on the same day as my telephone call to Gonzales, January 29th, was made by an observer in a high-rise apartment at 23rd Street and 9th Avenue in Manhattan. Mrs. Ann Carr, an acquaintance of Bud Hopkins, told him about the incident several days later. She had seen a lighted, top-shaped object hovering over the Hudson River in the direction of Weehawken, a small community located several miles south of North Hudson Park. The significance of this observation increased when we later learned that on the same evening and within the same hour, a fair few schoolboy had come home in terror, claiming that he had seen a landed UFO on spindly legs near the lake in the park. The boy had not been believed by his mother until the disclosure of other sightings in the area nearly a month later, and a brief account of the incident appeared in the Union City Hudson Dispatch of February 27th. About 2 a.m. on Thursday, February 19th, 1976, still another Stonehenge doorman, who was asked not to be identified, observed an unusual figure behaving in a peculiar manner not far from the original landing site. The figure appeared of normal height and was dressed in a coverall type garment. He had a light affixed to his head and walked stiffly, bending over repeatedly as if picking something up from the ground. He appeared to be carrying a bag. The light on his head stayed on at all times and faintly illuminated the ground as the figure bent over, although he kept to the darker sections of the park. The figure was observed by the doorman for approximately 20 minutes, from both inside the lobby and from the driveway in front of the building. The doorman said nothing about the incident at this time. The following morning, February 20th, at about the same time, another doorman, Teofilo Rodriguez, observed a similar figure behaving in much the same manner as earlier. Rodriguez said the figure continually bent over from the waist as though he were picking something up or putting something in the ground. A light on his head illuminated the area immediately around the body, but as before, he kept to the darker sections of the park. The doorman watched him on and off for more than two hours, from both inside and out. At that time, Rodriguez said nothing, but when on the following morning the same figure once again appeared, Rodriguez notified the Stonehenge security guard, Alberto Perez. After some initial skepticism, Perez agreed to go out onto the street in front of the building to see for himself. He observed the figure moving about near the flagpole, approximately 500 feet away. 
His description of the figure and its peculiar behavior essentially matched that of the two doormen, although Perez was of the opinion that the light was handheld rather than on the head. He said the figure walked slowly as if wearing heavy boots, bent over repeatedly from the waist, and made screwing motions in the ground. He watched for only a limited period of time, whereas Rodriguez saw the figure on and off until nearly 5 a.m. Three hours later, when Rodriguez was relieved on Saturday morning by the same doorman who had seen the figure two nights before, he mentioned the incidents and learned for the first time of the figure's first appearance. We heard about the incidents less than a week later on February 25th after the taping of the Obarski report for New York's Channel 5 10 o'clock news program. Perez and Rodriguez were interviewed at length by Hopkins and Sturrer at Stonehenge on February 27th, and the first doorman provided a detailed account of his own observation for Sturrer and me on March 14th. None of the witnesses attached an otherworldly significance to the figure's appearance, all having concluded that it must have been some crazy guy who was up to no good. The chronological order in which they occurred presents an excellent example of the escalation of strangeness. The first example of the observation of a structured object several hundred feet over the site does not qualify as a close encounter by the strictest definition. The second experience by multiple witnesses, on the other hand, is a classic example of a close encounter type 1. The third example, in which a near-landed object was seen at the same time that striking physical effects took place, qualifies as a close encounter type 2. The final example, which appears to be the same object seen at even closer range, involved a group of small sample gathering occupants and is an example of the close encounter type 3. These four reports, of course, did not come to our attention in the order in which they actually occurred as they are presented here. This, of course, is a reference to Hynek's scale of close encounters a close encounter being defined as less than 500 feet. Developed in 1972, it is used by ufologists to classify encounters. The scale initially contained only three types, but other UFO researchers have added on at least four more, though they are contentious in the community. Relatively new and more based in mainstream science is the Rio scale. First developed in 2001, The Rio scale is a tool used by astronomers searching for extraterrestrial intelligence to help communicate to the public how excited they should be about what has been observed. The scale measures the consequences for humans if the signal is from aliens, as well as the probability that the signal really is from aliens, and not a natural phenomenon or human-made. The scale gives a score between 0 and 10 so that the public can quickly see how important a signal really is. Quoting from the conclusion of the report, The Stonehenge Incidents. When George Obarski disclosed the details of his encounter with the ship's occupants in November 1975, we had no idea what a Pandora's box was being opened. Within a period of five months following that disclosure, our growing dossier of reported incidents now totals more than a dozen for the area in and around North Hudson Park. This clearly establishes the site as an apparent repeater locale for UFO manifestations. Even so, we have good reason to believe that we have seen only the tip of the iceberg as additional reports by local residents who refuse to be identified continue to be received. (laughs) 
were UFOs really looking for THE Stonehenge instead? Silly, maybe. But it still has to be asked.